Hello and welcome to today's lecture from my series on eco-modernism. Today I'll be looking at carbon capture and storage. The age of renewable clean energy is fast approaching, but not quite fast enough. In earlier presentations we looked at problems with providing all our energy requirements from renewable sources, and also at the difficulties of energy storage. It seems likely that, at least for the next few decades, we are going to need to keep burning fossil fuels to keep ourselves running as a society, until the replacement technologies come online. So in order to hit the net zero goals for 2050, we are definitely going to need to find a way to remove the pollutants from fossil fuel burning as quickly as possible. One way to do that might be to fit existing power stations with carbon capture technology, which sucks the CO2 out of the waste gases being emitted by the furnaces inside these enormous facilities. If we can do that and then store the CO2 out of the way, then we're minimising the harm that the legacy power stations can do until we're able to decommission them and replace them with something better. It's a tempting solution, potentially avoiding the need for all this costly retooling and the problems with unpredictability that renewable energy sources present, but is it really a viable answer to the problem of climate change? This is really a numbers game, and today I'm going to look at those numbers and also the technologies underpinning this controversial topic. Let's get started. Before we talk about carbon capture, it might first be worth looking at the carbon cycle. We've been covering the various technological approaches to solving climate change for several lectures, but I never really covered what the underlying issue with climate change is. That's largely because I'd assume pretty much everyone understands it at this point in history, but also because it's not really all that important. We're in a predicament, we know pretty much why and what needs to be done, and this lecture series is about the various ways we can solve the problem, not about the problem itself. In some sense, we all really need to know that there is a number, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere in parts per million. That number is currently too high, and it's getting higher. We need to make it significantly lower as soon as possible. But I think right now it's worth pointing out a few things about what's really happening with fossil fuels, because it might not be immediately obvious. And the first thing is that burning fossil fuels does not create carbon. It merely releases it. Carbon is one of the main components of organic life, it's been on the Earth since way before life began, and life started based on carbon because it has some specific properties that really make it suitable for the processes that life requires. As soon as life began, the carbon cycle began. The first living creatures started taking carbon out of the environment and putting it into their bodies. Over time, the amount of carbon in living things went up, and the amount in the atmosphere went down. Then, when those living things died, their bodies decayed and the carbon was released back into the atmosphere but not all of them died in a way that allowed their carbon to be released. For some of them, they died and fell to the bottom of the ocean, or were swallowed into the damp ground of swamps and marshes. Huge trees sank into the depths of stagnant pools where no oxygen could penetrate to break down the carbon in their cells, and hence the carbon became trapped underground forever. Well, potentially forever, because the carbon that was trapped underground, over millions of years, broke down into the hydrocarbon fuels that we know today oil, coal, natural gas. In a sense, the forests of 200 million years ago were the original carbon capture and storage technology on Earth. Plants captured carbon from the atmosphere, as they do today, and then when they died they stored it underground in vast deposits, keeping it out of the atmosphere permanently. Well, until humanity came along and started extracting that stored carbon because it turned out that it was a fantastic source of energy. So bit by bit we started releasing the carbon back into the atmosphere. If we could reproduce the process that created the oil, coal and gas in the first place, then we could surely reverse the damage that the burning of fossil fuels has caused. Carbon capture is the part of that process that involves taking carbon out of the air, or out of the waste pipes from fossil fuel burning power stations, and then somehow storing it away somewhere safe. Often that means funnelling it underground. We don't have millions of years to do this, so we need to find a way to speed up this process considerably. And that's where science comes in. Though there are many methods proposed to pull CO2 out of the air, only one is really working on a large scale right now, and that's carbon scrubbing. This relies on pulling air containing CO2 through a liquid that binds the CO2 in a chemical reaction. It's expensive and slow. More modern techniques are focusing around the use of porous metal organic frameworks, which act a bit like a selective sponge, pulling the CO2 out of a mixture of flue gases coming out of a fossil fuel burning plant. 
these sponges are then transferred to a secondary facility where they are compressed or heated to force the separated CO2 to be released. And at this point it is piped into a compressor, cooled and compressed to a liquid, and passed off to a storage facility. The technology is in the early stages, and so it would be a risky bet to say that it's likely to have much of an impact on the atmospheric CO2 concentrations in time to prevent the worst effects of global heating. But let's look at some of the figures from this rather lengthy paper published in 2018. The authors estimated the cost of fitting carbon capture, transport and storage systems onto existing power plants from a wide literature review and came up with the following figures. For coal-fired power, the cost to extract one tonne of CO2 is between 41 and 62 US dollars. When adding in the cost of transport and storage, for reasons that make no sense to me, the minimum numbers drop to $24 per tonne for the entire process. This is how much it costs to avoid one tonne of CO2. The maximum is $110 though, so let's take the average of $67 per tonne. For oil, let's just take the cost for refineries, an average of $83 per tonne, and for gas, the average cost is $91 per tonne. This is a graph of annual CO2 emissions by fuel from the ever-wonderful Our World in Data website. Values for last year are approximately 14 billion tonnes of CO2 from coal, 12 billion tonnes from oil and 8 billion tonnes from gas. That's all rounded to the nearest billion. This is just an estimate after all. So let's add all of this up. If you want to keep burning these fuels at today's rate, what would the total cost be? Well, for coal alone it would be slightly over a trillion dollars per year. For oil it would be fractionally less than a trillion dollars per year, and for gas it would be about 728 billion dollars per year. So when we add those up we get a total of roughly 2.8 trillion dollars per year. Also bear in mind that research shows that CCS systems reduce the efficiency of these power generation plants by roughly 10%, so we would also have to increase our fuel burning by more than another 10%, with further CCS costs to make up for that. We wouldn't basically get any change from $3 trillion per year, and we're still only capturing roughly 80-90% to 90 of the carbon because these systems are not 100% effective. Maybe we can reduce the cost of these systems with economies of scale and drive that down to $2 trillion, or even one and a half. but that still sounds like a fair bit more than we're willing to pay. Ignoring the cost, let's continue. For sake of argument, say that we've managed to find a way to capture huge amounts of CO2 and now we need to find somewhere to put it to keep it out of the atmosphere permanently. We need somewhere stable and predictable where we can maintain a large pressure for a long period of time without leakage. The storage location also needs to be large enough to store cubic kilometres of carbon dioxide and geologically stable. Oh, and we need to be able to get at it relatively easily. We currently emit roughly 36 billion tonnes of CO2 per year globally. CO2 in liquid form has a density of 1,101 kilograms per cubic metre, which means that the 36 billion tonnes we emit would take up just over 30 cubic kilometres of space. And it only exists at pressures more than 5.1 times atmospheric pressure, so you can't just shove it in a lake somewhere and forget about it. Besides, that's a big lake. You would fill up Lake Erie in roughly 12 years, and you couldn't possibly build enough storage tanks to hold that volume of liquid CO2. Besides, where would you put them? Bury them in landfill? And it just so happens that there is an excellent possibility here, which is also rather ironic. It turns out that there are large empty reservoirs underground with entirely impermeable caps, where we know liquids and gases can remain at great pressure for thousands of years without ever being released, because, well, we dug into them and pulled out all those liquids to fuel our cars. I'm talking about oil reservoirs. It seems a bit far-fetched, after all, the Earth is naturally full of fissures and cracks and underground water and all sorts of other methods by which we might lose carbon dioxide from these underground reservoirs back into the atmosphere and undo all of our good work. This 2018 paper from the journal Nature investigates whether underground storage is in principle effective. Their conclusion is that it should work and that we will be able to store CO2 safely for thousands of years with only minimal leakage, which is great but they only consider storing 12 gigatons or 12 billion tonnes of CO2, which is the European Union's entire 2050 target. It's a start, I guess, but it's only a fraction of what we need to store globally to reverse climate change. We emit three times this globally every year, and we need all of that to be captured and stored if we don't reduce it by other means. <laughs>
So far we've looked at retrofitting all dirty fossil fuel burning facilities with carbon capture technology. But can we do more than that? Can we remove CO2 that's already been emitted into the atmosphere? It's time for some more numbers. What's the total amount of carbon we'll need to store? Well, let's say that human civilization becomes carbon neutral tomorrow and emits no more carbon ever. We're currently at roughly 410 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, and we need to get back to the pre-industrial levels of 280 or so. So that means we need to remove about 130 parts per million CO2 from the atmosphere. The atmosphere in total contains roughly 5 billion billion kilograms of gases, so 130 parts per million of CO2 would be 130 millionths of this, or 650 billion tonnes. The 12 billion tonnes used in the modelling for the 2018 paper we saw earlier is clearly not going to fix the problem. It's about 2% of the total required. But if we can at least get to the point where we can store a few years' excess production out of the way, then that gives us a few more years to fix the source of the problem, which is our own emissions. One other possibility here is we may be able to repurpose our old fossil fuel burning plants to help us in this regard. The Drax power plant in the UK was recently converted from coal burning to wood burning. If we could convert coal burning plants to burn wood and use locally sourced wood without a large carbon footprint, then we could suck CO2 out of the atmosphere using trees, burn those trees to generate power, trap the CO2 emitted in the burning and store it. This uses trees to extract CO2 for us, which is what they've evolved to do after all, and then we don't just let them rot away and release the CO2 back into the atmosphere, but we extract it during the burning process and put it somewhere safe. The process is known as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, BECCS. The Drax plant estimates that it could remove one tonne of CO2 per day from the atmosphere in this way. There are roughly 2,400 coal-fired plants in the world, so if we converted them all, and if they all worked like the Drax plant, then that would remove 2,400 tonnes of CO2 per day, which is nearly a million tonnes per year. Well, that may sound like a lot, but it's a minuscule amount compared to the entire output of civilization. It would take us hundreds of thousands of years to remove the excess 650 billion tonnes with this method. It's better than nothing, I suppose, but it doesn't really help much. Finally, there are the small number of direct air capture solutions, including the Canadian company Carbon Engineering, famously funded in part by Bill Gates. They're one of the leaders in this technology, sucking CO2 directly out of the air in the same way a plant would, and then storing it underground in certain rock formations, or else transforming it into other industrial products. They reckon that they can remove CO2 from the atmosphere at a cost of roughly $100 per tonne, but so far the only plant they have removes just one tonne per day, which is hardly enough. They claim that they might eventually be able to build installations capturing 1 million tonnes per year, expecting a pilot facility of this size to come online in 2023. And that would indeed be truly impressive, if true. Let's say I remain doubtful. But say they can do this, we'd still need tens of thousands of such plants spread across the globe to remove our current global CO2 output. And then you'd need somewhere to store the CO2 once it's been captured. And see above for why that might be tricky to achieve. In summary, carbon capture and storage is a new technology and more research is required to see how it could help removing the excess carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. Currently there is no technology that is even vaguely up to the task of removing a substantial proportion of the excess CO2 that's causing global warming, and certainly not on the timescale required. Old power plants could be converted, which works to an extent, but is expensive and is at best a sticking plaster stuck over a vast gushing wound. CCS is a promising technology, and eventually we'll have to find a way to remove all that excess CO2 from the atmosphere, but for now it just seems like a bit of a distant dream. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you continue to listen and join me on this journey through the world of eco-modernism. Next time we'll be looking at transport and investigating the different ways we can decarbonise our transport infrastructure, including some new technologies and a few old ones too. I'll see you then.